my question is is oral sex performed on you within that definition as you under stood as i understood it it was not no the grand jurors uh would like to know upon what basis what legal basis you're declining to answer more specific questions about this i've mentioned to you that uh obviously you have privileges privileges against self-incrimination um, there's no general right not to answer questions and so one of the questions from the grand jurors is what basis what legal basis um, are you declining to answer these questions i'm not trying to evade my legal obligations or my willingness to help the grand jury achieve their legal obligations as i understand it you want to examine the, whether you believe I told the truth in my deposition, whether I asked Ms. Lewinsky not to tell the truth, and whether I did anything else with evidence or in any other way amounted to uh, an obstruction of justice or a subornation of perjury. And I'm prepared to answer all questions that, I, that the grand jury needs to draw that conclusion. Now. Respectfully, I believe the grand jurors can ask me if I believe, just like that grand juror did, you could ask me, do you believe that this conduct falls within that definition? If it does, then you're free to conclude that my testimony is that I didn't do that. And I believe that you can achieve that without requiring me to say and do things that I don't think are necessary and that I think, frankly, uh, go too far uh, in trying to criminalize my private life. If a person touched another person, if you touched another person on the breast, would that be, in your view, and was it within your view when you took the deposition, uh, within the definition of sexual relations? If the person being deposed, in yes. this case me, directly touched the breast of another person with the purpose to arouse or gratify, under that definition, that would be included. Only directly, sir, or would it be directly or through clothing? Well, I, I, would, I think the common sense definition would be directly. That's how I would infer what it means. If the person being deposed kissed the breast of another person, would that be in the definition of sexual relations as you understood it when you were under oath in the Jones case? Yes, that would constitute contact. I think that would. If it were direct contact, I believe it would. I, I, maybe I should read it again just to make sure. Because this basically says if there was any direct contact with an intent to arouse or gratify, if that was the intent of the contact, then that would fall within the definition. That's correct. All right. So touching, in your view, then and now, the person being deposed, touching or kissing the breast of another person would fall within the definition. That's correct, sir. And you testified that you didn't have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky in the Jones deposition under that definition, That's correct? That's correct, sir. If the person being deposed uh, touched the genitalia of another person, would that be in with the intent to arouse the uh, sexual desire, arouse or gratify, as defined in uh, definition one? Uh, would that be, under your understanding, then and now, Sexual yes, relations. Yes, sir. Yes, it would? Yes, it would. If you had a direct contact with any of these places in the body, if you had direct contact with intent to arouse or gratify, that would fall within the definition. So you didn't do any of those three things, you were, Monica Lewinsky? You were free to infer that uh, my testimony is that I did not 
have sexual relations as I understood this term to be defined. Including touching her breast, kissing her breast, or touching her genitalia. That's correct. Would you agree with me that the uh, insertion of an object into the genitalia of another person with the desire to gratify sexually would fit within the definition used in the Jones case as sexual relations? That there's nothing here about that, is there? I don't know that I ever thought about that one way or the other. The question is, uh, under the definition as you understood it then, under the definition as you understand it now, pardon me, just Deposition ex Exhibit 1, Question 1, under the, uh, in the Jones case, definition of sexual relations. For do that before you, Mr. President. Excuse me. I do, sir. I, I've got it right here. I'm looking at it. As you understood the definition then and as you understood it now, would it include sticking an object into the genitalia of another person in order to arouse or gratify the sexual desire of any person? Would it constitute, in other words, contact with the genitalia? I don't object? know the answer to that. I suppose you could argue that since section 2, paragraph 2, was eliminated, and paragraph 2 actually dealt with the object issue, that perhaps whoever wrote this didn't intend for paragraph 1 to cover the, an object and basically meant direct contact. So if I were asked, I've not been asked this question before, but I guess that's the way I would read it. If it uh, would, if it would not be covered, that activity would not be covered. That's right. If the activity you just mentioned would be covered in number two, and number two was stricken, I think you can infer logically that paragraph one was not intended to cover it. But as I said, I've not been asked this before. I'm just doing the best I can. Well, if, uh, if someone were to hold or a judge were to hold that you're incorrect, and that definition one does include the hypo I've given to you, because we're talking in hypos so that you don't, under your request here, if someone were to tell you or rule that you're wrong, that the insertion of an object into somebody else's genitalia with the intent to arouse or gratify the sexual desire of any person is within definition one, Mr. Weidenberg, excuse me, I have not objected here for any question you've asked. I must tell you, I cannot understand that question. I think it's improper, and if the witness can understand it, he may answer it. I'll be happy to rephrase it. If you're wrong and it's within definition one, uh, did you engage in sexual relations under the definition with Monica Lewinsky? But, Mr. Weisberg, I have said all along that I would say what I thought it meant and you can infer that I didn't. Uh, this is an unusual question, but it's a slippery slope. Uh, I, we can, I have tried to, to deal with some very delicate areas here, and, and, and in one case, and I've given you a very forthright answer about what I thought that was not within here. Um, all I can tell you is, whatever I thought was covered and I thought about this carefully, and, and let me just point out, this was uncomfortable for me. I had to acknowledge, because of this definition, that under this definition I had actually had sexual relations once with Jennifer Flowers, a person who had spread all kinds of ridiculous, dishonest, exaggerated stories about me for money. And I knew when I did that it would be leaked, it was, and I was embarrassed. 
but I did it. So I, I tried to read this carefully. I can tell you what I thought it covered. And I can tell you that I, I do not believe I did anything that I thought was covered by this. As I understand your testimony, Mr. President, um, touching somebody's breast with the intent to arouse, um, with the intent to arouse or gratify sexual desire of any person is covered. Uh, kissing the breast is covered. Touching the genitalia is covered, correct? In fairness, the witness said directly in each one of those cases. Directly is covered, correct? I believe it is, yes, sir. Oral sex, in your view, is not covered, correct? No. If performed on the deponent. Is not covered, correct? That's my reading of this number one. And you're declining to answer the hypothetical about insertion of an object. I need to inform you, Mr. President, we'll go on, at least for now, but I need to inform you um, that uh, the grand jury um, will consider your not answering the questions more directly and their determination of whether or not they're going to issue uh, another subpoena. Let me switch the topic and talk to you about uh, John Podesta uh, and some of the other aides you met, you met with and spoke to after this story became public on January 21st. 1998, the date of the Washington Post story. Do you recall meeting with him around January 23rd, 1998, Friday a.m. in your study, two days after the Washington Post story, and extremely explicitly telling him that you didn't have, engage in any kind of sex in any way, shape, or form with Monica Lewinsky, including oral sex? I meet with uh, John Podesta almost every day. I meet with uh, a number of people. The only thing I, uh, what happened in a couple of days after what you did was revealed is a blizzard to me. The only thing I recall is that I met with certain people and a few of them I said, I didn't have sex with Monica Lewinsky or I didn't have an affair with her or something like that. I had a very careful thing I said, and I tried not to say anything else. And, and I, it might be that John Podesta was one of them, but I do not remember the specific meeting about which you ask or the specific comments to which you referred. You and don't remember? Seven months ago, I'd have no way to remember, no. You don't remember denying any kind of sex in any way, shape, or form with him, including oral sex, correct? I remember that I issued a number of denials uh, to people that I thought needed to hear them, but I tried to, to be careful and to be accurate in them. I do not remember what I said to John Podesta. Uh, surely if you told him that, that would be a falsehood, correct? Oh, I didn't say that, sir. I didn't say that at all. That is not covered by the definition, and I did not address it in my statement. Well, let me ask you then. If you told him, um, perhaps he thought it was covered, uh, I don't know, but if you told him, if you denied to him sex in any way, shape, or form, kind of similar to what Mr. Bennett did at the deposition, including oral sex, uh, wouldn't that have been a falsehood? Now, Mr. Weisberg, I told you in response to a grand jury's question, you asked me, did I believe that oral sex performed on the person being deposed was covered by that definition? And I said, no, I don't believe it's covered by the definition. I said, you are free to conclude that I did not do things that I believe were covered by the definition. And you have asked me a number of questions and I have acknowledged things that I believe are covered by the definition. Since that was not covered by the definition, I want to fall back on my statement. Look, I'm not trying to be evasive here. I'm trying to protect my privacy, my family's privacy. And I'm trying to stick to what the deposition was about. If the deposition wasn't about this and didn't cover it, then I don't believe that I should be required to go beyond my statement. Mr. President, it's not our intent to embarrass you, but since we have to look, among other things, at obstruction of justice, questions of obstruction of justice and perjury, the answer to some of these delicate and unfortunate questions are absolutely required. And, uh, 
that is the purpose that we have to ask them for. That's not, I'm Mr. Weisberg, opinion. with respect, you don't need to know the answer for that if the answer, no matter what the answer is, it wouldn't constitute perjury because it wasn't sexual relations as defined by the judge. The only reason you need to know that is for some other reason. It couldn't have anything to do with perjury. Mr. President, one of the, one of the nice things about, um, uh, one of the uh, normal things about an investigation and a grand jury investigation is that the grand jurors uh, and the prosecutors get to ask the questions unless they're improper and unless there's a legal basis. As I understand from your answers, there's no legal basis for which you to decline to answer these questions. And I'll uh, uh, ask you again uh, uh, to answer the question. I'm unaware of any legal basis for you not to. If you, well, if you told the, you just the question. Please. The question is, if you told John Podesta two days after the story broke, something to this effect, that you didn't have any kind of sex in any way, shape, or form, including oral sex with Ms. Lewinsky, were you telling him the truth? And let me say again with respect, this is an indirect way to try to get me to testify to questions that have no bearing on whether I committed perjury. You apparently agree that it has no bearing no, on whether I, don't, I, I don't committed agree. perjury. Mr. President, I'm sorry, with respect, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to argue with you about it. I just am going to ask you again, in fact, direct you to answer the question. I'm not going to answer that question because I believe it's a question about conduct that whatever the answer to it is, would, does not bear on the perjury because oral sex performed on the deponent under this definition is not sexual relations. It is not covered the by this definition. The witness is not declining to tell you anything he said to John Pierre. The, um, you denied the, the witness is not declining to tell me anything. Did you deny oral sex in any way, shape, or form to, uh, to John Podesta? I told you so before, and I will say again. In the aftermath of this story breaking, and what was told about it, uh, the, the next two days, the next three days, are just a blur to me. I don't remember to whom I talked, when I talked to them, or what I said. So you're not declining to answer, you just don't remember? I honestly don't remember, no. Okay. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that anybody who had a contrary memory is wrong. I do not remember. Do you recall denying uh, any sexual relationship uh, with um, Monica Lewinsky to the following people? Harry Thompson, Erskine Bowles, Harold Ickes, Mr. Podesta, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Jordan, Ms. Betty Curry. Do you recall denying uh, any sexual relationship with Monica Lewinsky to those individuals? I recall telling a number of those people that I didn't have, uh, either I didn't have an affair with Monica Lewinsky or didn't have sex with her. And I believe, sir, that, well, you have to ask them what they thought. But I was using those terms in the normal way people use them. You will have to ask them what they thought I was saying. If they testified that you denied a sexual relations or relationship with Monica Lewinsky, or if they've told us that you denied that, do you have any reason to doubt in the days after the story broke? Do you have any reason to doubt? No. The, let me say this. It's no secret to anybody that I hope that this relationship would never become public. It's, it's a matter of fact that it had been many, many months since there had been anything improper about it in terms of improper contact. Did you I deny it to I not, Mr. President? Let me finish. So what I did not want to mislead my friends, but I wanted to find language where I could say that. I also, frankly, did not want to turn any of them into witnesses uh, because I... And sure enough, they all became witnesses. Well, you knew they were so, witnesses. And so I said to them things that were true about this relationship. That I used in, in the in the language I used. I said, "There's nothing going on between us." That was true. I said, uh, "I have not had sex with her, as I define it." That was true. And did I hope uh, that I would never have to be here on this day giving this testimony? Of course. 
but I also didn't want to do anything to complicate um, this matter further. So I said things that were true. They may have been misleading, and if they were, I have to take responsibility for it, and I'm sorry. They may have been misleading, sir, and you knew, though, after January 21st, when the Post article broke and said that Judge Starr was looking into this, you knew that they might be witnesses. You knew that they might be called into a grand jury, didn't you? So I think I was quite careful what I said after that. I may have said something to all these people of that effect, but I, I also, whenever anybody asked me any details, I said, look, I don't want you to be a witness or I turn you into witness or give you information that could get you in trouble. I just wouldn't talk. I, I by and large, didn't talk to people about it. If all of these people... Let's leave out Mrs. Curry for a minute. Vernon Jordan, Sid Blumenthal, John Podesta, Harold Ickes, Erskine Bowles, Harry Thomason. After the story broke, after Judge Starr's involvement was known on January 21st, have said that you denied a sexual relationship with them. Are you denying that? No. And you've told I'm just us telling you, you what I meant by it. I told you what I meant by it when they started this deposition. You're told us now that you were being careful, but then it might have been misleading. Is that correct? It might have been since... Uh, we have seen uh, this four-year, $40 million investigation come down to parsing the definition of sex. I think it might have been. I, I don't think at the time that I thought that's what this was going to be about. In fact, if you remember the headlines at the time, even you mentioned that post story, all the headlines were, uh, and all the talking, uh, the people who talked about this, including a lot who have been quite sympathetic to your operation, said, well, this is not really a story about sex. Uh, this is a story about subordination of perjury and these talking points and all this other stuff. So I, what I was trying to do was to, to give them something they could, that would be true, even if misleading in the context of this deposition, and keep them out of trouble. And let's deal, and deal with the, what I thought was the almost ludicrous suggestion that uh, I had urged someone to lie or tried to suborn perjury in other ways. I want to go over some questions again. I don't think you're going to answer them, sir, and so I don't need a lengthy response, just a, a yes or a no, and I understand the basis upon which you're not answering them, but I need to ask them for the record. If Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area you touched her breast, would she be lying? Let me say something about all this. All I really need for you, Mr. President, I know, is to say I won't, I won't answer under the previous grounds or, or to answer the question, you see, because we only have four hours and your answers I know. Have well, been extremely it, lengthy. I know that. I'll give you four hours and 30 seconds if you'll let me say something general about this. I will answer to your satisfaction that I won't, based on my statement, I will not answer. I would like 30 seconds at the end to make a statement, and you can have 30 seconds more on your time if you let me say this to the grand jury and to you. And I don't think it's disrespectful at all. It's, I've had a lot of time to think about this. But go ahead and ask your questions. The question is, if Monica, if Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area, you touched her breast, would she be lying? That is not my recollection. My recollection is that I did not have sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky, and I'm staying on my former statement about that. If she my, says... My, my, my statement is that I did not have sexual relations as defined by that. If she says that you kissed her breast, would she be lying? I'm going to revert to my former statement. Okay. If Monica Lewinsky says that while you were in the Oval Office area, you touched her genitalia, would she be lying? And that calls for a yes, no, or reverting to your former statement. I will revert to my statement on that. If Monica Lewinsky says that you used a cigar as a sexual aid with her in the Oval Office area, would she be lying? Yes, no, or, or won't answer. I will revert to my former statement. If Monica Lewinsky says that you had phone sex with her, would she be lying? Well, uh, that is, uh, at least in general terms, I think is covered by my statement. Uh, I addressed that in my statement, and that uh, I don't believe is... Let me, read a, let me define phone sex for purposes of my question. Phone sex occurs when a party to a phone conversation masturbates while the other party is talking in a sexually explicit manner. And the question is, if Monica Lewinsky says that you had phone sex with her, would she be lying? I think that is covered by my statement.
did you on uh, on or about January the 13th, 1998, Mr. President, ask Erskine Bowles to ask John Hilly if he would give a recommendation for Monica Lewinsky. In 1998? Yes. On or about January 13th, 1998, did you ask Erskine Bowles, your chief of staff, if he would ask John Hilly to give a recommendation for Monica Lewinsky? At some point, sir, uh, I believe I talked to Erskine Bowles about whether uh, Monica Lewinsky could get a recommendation uh, that was not negative from the Legislative Affairs Office. I believe I did. I just didn't hear the very last part. I think the answer is, I think yes, at some point I talked to Erskine Bowles about this. I do not know what the date was. At some point I did talk to him. And if Erskine Bowles has said, has told us that he told John Podesta to carry out your wishes, and John Podesta states that it was three or four days before your deposition, which would be the 13th or the 14th, are you in a position to deny that? The 13th or 14th of? January, as to date. I don't know. I, I don't know when the date was. Okay. I'm not in a position to deny it. I won't deny it. I'm sure that they're both truthful men. I'm, I, I, I don't know when the date was. You recall asking Erskine Bowles to... to I recalled that. talking to Erskine Bowles uh, about that, and my, my recollection is, sir, that Ms. Lewinsky was moving to New York, wanted to get a job in the private sector, was confident she would get a good recommendation from the Defense Department, and was concerned that because she'd been moved from the Legislative Affairs Office, transferred to the Defense Department, that her ability to get a job might be undermined by a bad recommendation from the Legislative Affairs Office. So I asked Erskine if uh, we could get her a recommendation that just was at least neutral so that if she had a good recommendation from the Defense Department, it wouldn't prevent her from getting a job in the private sector. If Mr. Bowles has told us that, in fact, you, you told him that she already had a job and had already listed Mr. Hilly as a reference and wanted him to be available as a recommendation, would you be any... Is that inconsistent with your memory? A little bit, but I, I think I, my memory is that when you're when you get a job like that, you have to give them a resume which says where you've worked and who your supervisor was. And I think that that's my recollection. My recollection is that uh, slightly different from that. And who was it that asked you to do that on Monica Lewinsky's behalf? I think she did. You know, she tried for months and months to get a job uh, back in the White House, not so much in the West Wing, but somewhere in the White House complex, including the old executive office building. And she talked to Marcia Scott, among others. Uh, she very much wanted to come back. And she interviewed for some jobs, but never got one. She was, from time to time, upset about it. Um, and I think what sh she was afraid of is that she couldn't get a, from the minute she left the White House, she was worried about this, that she would, that if she didn't come back to the White House and work for a while and get a good job recommendation, that no matter how well she had done at the Pentagon, it might hurt her future employment prospects. Well, it became obvious that, you know, her mother had moved to New York, she wanted to go to New York, she wasn't going to get a job in the White House, so she wanted to get a job in the private sector, and she said, uh, I hope that I won't get a a letter out of the Legislative Affairs Office that will prevent my getting a job in the private sector. And that's what I talked to Erskine about. Now that's my entire memory of this. All right. I want to go back briefly to the December 28th conversation with Ms. Lewinsky. I believe you testified to the effect uh, that uh, she asked you, what if they asked me about gifts she gave me? My question, to, my question to you is, after that statement by her, 
Did you ever have a conversation with Betty Curry about gifts or picking something up from Monica Lewinsky? I don't believe I did, sir, no. You never told her anything to this effect, that Monica has something uh, to give you? That no, you say Betty Curry? No, sir, I didn't. I don't have any memory of that, whatever. And so you have no knowledge that, uh, or you had no knowledge at the time that uh, Betty Curry went and picked up, your secretary went and picked up from Monica Lewinsky items that were called for by the Jones subpoena and, and hid them under her bed. You had no knowledge that anything remotely like that was going to happen. I did not. I did not know she had those items, I believe, until they were, that was made public. And you agree with me that that would be a very wrong thing to do, uh, to hide evidence in a civil case, or any case. Isn't that true? Yes, I don't know that uh, that Ms. Curry knew that that's what she had uh, at all, but... I'm not saying she did. I'm just I, saying... I had... Uh, it, it is... If Monica Lewinsky did that after they had been subpoenaed and she knew what she was doing, she should not have done that. And, if and you I... Knew, and, and if, indeed, I myself told her, if they ask you for gifts, you have to give them what you have. And I don't understand if, in fact, she was uh, worried about this, why she was so worried about it. It was no big deal. I want to talk about a December 17th phone conversation you had with Monica Lewinsky at approximately 2 a.m. Uh, do you recall making that conversation and telling her initially uh, about the death of Brett, Betty's brother, but then telling her that she was on the witness list and that it broke your heart that she was on the witness list? No, sir, I don't, but it would, it, this, it would, it is quite possible that that happened because if you remember earlier in this meeting, you asked me some questions about what I'd said to Monica about testimony and affidavits, and I was struggling to try to remember whether this happened in a meeting or a phone call. Now, I remember. I called her to tell her Betty's brother had died. I remember that. And I know it was in the middle of uh, December, and I, I believe it was before Monica had been subpoenaed. So I think it is quite possible that if I called her at that time and I'd not talked to her since the 6th, and you asked me this earlier, I believe when I saw her on the 6th, I don't think I knew she was on the witness list then. Then it's quite possible I would say something like that. I don't have any memory of it. But I certainly wouldn't dispute that I might have said that. And in that conversation, or in any conversation in which you informed her she was on the witness list, did you tell her, you know, you can always say that you were coming to see Betty or bringing me letters? Did you tell her anything like that? I don't remember. She was coming to see Betty. I can tell you this, I absolutely never asked her to lie. Sir, every time you came to see Betty and you were in the Oval Office, she was coming to see you too, wasn't she? Or just about every time? I think just about every time. I, I don't think every time. I think there was a time or two when she came to see Betty when she didn't see me. So do you remember telling her any time uh, when you told her or after you told her that she was on the witness list, something to this effect? You know you can always say you were coming to see Betty or you were bringing me letters. I don't remember exactly what I told her that night. I, I, I don't remember that. I remember talking about the nature of our relationship, how she got in, but I also w will tell you that I felt quite comfortable that she could have executed a truthful affidavit which would not have disclosed the embarrassing details of a relationship that we had had which had been over for many, many months by the time this incident occurred. Did you tell her any time in December something to that effect? You know you can always say that you were coming to see Betty or you were bringing me letters. Did you say that or anything like it in December 97 or January 98 to Monica Lewinsky? Well, that's a very broad question. I do not recall saying anything like that in connection with her testimony. Uh, I can tell you what I do remember saying, if you want to know, but I don't. We might have talked about 
what to say in a, in a non-legal context at some time in the past, but I have no specific memory of, the, of that conversation. I, I do remember what I said to her about possible testimony. You would agree with me if you did say something like that to her, uh, to urge her to say that to the Jones people, that that would be part of an effort to mislead the Jones people, no matter how evil they are and corrupt. I didn't say they were evil. I said what they were doing here was wrong, and it was. Wouldn't that be misleading? Well, again, you're trying to get me to characterize something that, I'm, that I don't know if I said or not without knowing whether the, whole, uh, whether the context is complete or not. So I would have to know what was the context, what were all the surrounding facts. I can tell you this. I never asked Ms. Lewinsky to lie. The first time she raised with me the possibility that she might be a witness, or I told her, you suggested a possibility in this December 17th time frame, I told her she had to get a lawyer. And I never asked her to lie. Did you ever say anything like that? You can always say that you were coming to see Betty or bringing me letters. Was that part of a, any kind of a, anything you said to her or a cover story before you had any idea she was going to be part of Paula Jones? I'm, I'm, I might well have said that. Okay. Because I certainly didn't want this to come out if I could help it. And I, I was concerned about that. I was embarrassed about it. I knew it was wrong. And, uh, and, you know, of course I didn't want it to come out. But, but you're saying that you didn't say anything. I want to make sure I understand. Did you say anything like that once you knew or thought she might be a witness in the Jones case? Did you repeat that statement or something like it to her? Well, again, I don't recall. And I don't recall whether I might have done something like that. For example, somebody says, what if the reporters ask me or this, that, or the other thing? I can tell you this. When, in the context of whether she could be a witness, I have a recollection that, that she asked me, well, what do I do if I get called as a witness? And I said, you have to get a lawyer. I, that, and that's all I said, and I never asked her to lie. Did you tell her to tell the truth? Well, I think the implication was she would tell the truth. I've already told you that I felt strongly that she could issue, that she could execute an affidavit that would be factually truthful that might get her uh, out of uh, having to testify. Now, it obviously wouldn't if the Jones people knew this because they knew that if they could get this and leak it, it would serve their larger purposes, even if the judge ruled that she couldn't be a witness in the case. The judge later ruled she wouldn't be a witness in the case. The judge later ruled the case had no merit. Uh, so I knew that. And what I, did I hope she'd be able to get out of testifying on an affidavit? Absolutely. Did I want her to execute a false affidavit? No, I did not. If Monica Lewinsky has stated that her affidavit that she didn't have sexual relationship with you is in fact a lie, I take it you disagree with that? No, I told you before what I thought the issue was there. I think the issue is how do you define sexual relationship? And there was no definition imposed on her at the time she executed the affidavit. Therefore, she was free to give it any reasonable meaning. And if she says she was lying, and I will, common sense, ordinary meeting that you talked about earlier, Mr. President, that most Americans would have, if she says sexual relationship, saying I didn't have one was a lie because I had oral sex with the president, I take it you would disagree with that. Now, we're back to where we started, and I have to invoke my statement. But let me just say one thing. I've read a lot, and obviously I don't know whether any of it's accurate about what she said and what is what purports to be on these tapes. And this thing, and I've searched my own memory, this reminds me to some extent of the hearings when Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill were both testifying under oath. Now, in some rational way, they could not have both been telling the truth since they had directly different accounts of a shared set of facts. Fortunately, or maybe you think unfortunately, there was no special prosecutor to try to go after one or the other of them, to take sides and try to prove one was a liar. And so Judge Thomas was able to go on and serve on the Supreme Court. But what I learned from that, I can tell you that I was a citizen out there just listening. 
And, and when I heard both of them testify what I believed after it was over, I believed that they both thought they were telling the truth. This is, you're dealing with, in some ways, the most mysterious area of human life. I'm doing the best I can to give you honest answers. Mr. President. And that's all I'm I can sorry. tell you. And, and uh, you know, those people both testified under oath. So if there had been a special prosecutor, they could one of them uh, could have gone after Anita Hill, another could have gone after Clarence Thomas. I thank God there was no such thing then, because I don't believe that it was a proper thing. And I think they both thought they were telling the truth. So maybe Ms. Lewinsky believes she's telling the truth. And I'm glad she got her mother and herself out of trouble. I'm glad you gave her that sweeping immunity. I'm glad for the whole thing. I, 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 it breaks my heart that she was ever involved in this. I want to go back to a question about Vernon Jordan. I want to go back to late December and early January. Late December of 97, early January of 98. During this time, Mr. President, you're being sued for sexual harassment by a woman who claims, among other things, that others got benefits that she didn't because she didn't have oral sex with you. While this is happening, your powerful friend, Vernon Jordan, is helping to get Monica Lewinsky a job and a lawyer. He's helping to get a job and a lawyer for someone who had some kind of sex with you and who has been subpoenaed in the very case, the Jones case. Don't you see a problem with this? Didn't you see a problem with this? No. Would you like to know why? Isn't that why Vernon, I would, but isn't that why Vernon Jordan asked you on December 19th whether or not you had sexual relationships with Monica Lewinsky and why he asked her because he knew it would be so highly improper to be helping her with a lawyer and a job if in fact she had had a relationship with you? I don't know. I don't believe that at all. I don't believe that at all, particularly since uh, even if you look at the facts here, in their light most unfavorable to me. No one has suggested that there was any sexual harassment on my part. And I don't think it was wrong to be helping her. Look. Uh, a subpoenaed witness in a case against absolutely. you? Absolutely. Look, for one thing, I had already proved in two ways that I was not trying to influence her testimony. I didn't order her to be hired at the White House. I could have done so, I wouldn't do it. She tried for months to get in, she was angry. Secondly, after I, terminated, after I terminated the improper contact with her, she wanted to come in more than she did. She got angry when she didn't get in sometimes. I knew that that uh, might make her more likely to speak. And I still did it because I had to limit the contact. And thirdly, let me say, I, I formed an opinion really early in 1996. And again, it, well, let me finish the sentence. I formed an opinion early in 1996, once I got into this unfortunate and wrong conduct, that when I uh, stopped it, which I knew I'd have to do, and which I should have done a long time before I did, that she would talk about it. Not because Monica Lewinsky's a bad person. She's basically a good girl. She's a good young woman with a good heart and a good mind. I think she is burdened by some unfortunate conditions of her, her upbringing. But she's basically a good person. But I knew that the minute there was no longer any contact, she would talk about this. She would have to. She couldn't help it. It was, a, it was a part of her psyche. So I had put myself at risk, sir. I was not trying to buy her silence or get Vernon Jordan to buy her silence. I thought she was a good person. She had not been involved with me for a long time in any improper way, several months. And I wanted to help her get on with her life. It's just as simple as that. You gave me my 30 second soliloquy, so I owe you 30 seconds more. Very generous. Uh, that actually segues very nicely into uh, one of the grand jurors asked, pointed out actually, that you indicated at the beginning of the deposition that you would, uh, you would answer all the grand jurors, you wanted to answer all the grand jurors' questions. 
and they wanted to know whether you would be willing to stay beyond the four hour period to, in fact, answer all their questions. Well, let's see how we do in the next hour, and then we'll decide. Okay. Let me uh, draw your attention to early January this year. Uh, after Christmas, uh, before your deposition, uh, do you remember talking uh, to Betty Curry about Monica, who had just called her and said that she, Monica, needed to talk to you before she signed something? I'm not sure that I do remember that, but go ahead. This is in early January, she told, and then Betty Curry relayed this to you, that Monica called, it's important, she needs to talk to you uh, before she signs something, and then you do indeed uh, talk to Monica that day on the telephone. I, I did talk to her that day? Yes. Excuse me, if that's a question, if you have a memory of that, you can answer it. I'm trying to remember when the last time I talked to her was. I am aware, sir, that she signed this affidavit about this time, and sometime in the first week of January. Um, I may have talked to her before she did it. I, I don't know. I, I talked to her a number of times after, between... Uh, the time Betty's brother died, Christmas, then I saw her on December 28th. I, I may have talked to her, but I don't remember the specific conversation. And you would have talked about uh, the, uh, she had just given you a gift, actually, in early January, a uh, book on the presidents of the United States. And you discussed this with her, and she said that you said you liked it a lot. I did like it a lot. I, I told you that my impression, my belief was that she gave me that book for Christmas. Maybe that's not right. I think she had that book delivered to me for Christmas. Uh, and then, as I remember, I went to Bosnia and uh, for some reason she wasn't there around Christmas time. But anyway, I. I Maybe I didn't get it till January. My recollection was that I had gotten it right before Christmas. Let me see if I can jog your memory further. Monica talked to you in that phone conversation that uh, told you that she had just met with her attorney that Mr. Jordan arranged with her. And their attorney said that if she is deposed, that they're going to ask her how she got her job at the Pentagon. And Monica then asked you, what do you think I should say? How, how do I answer that question? How did I get the job at the Pentagon? Did you talk to Monica about that, about possibilities? I don't believe, no, I, I don't remember her asking me that, but if she, uh, if she had asked me that, I would have told her to tell the truth. I, I, uh, and I didn't, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly how she got her job at the Pentagon. I know Evelyn Lieberman wanted to transfer out of the job she had, and somebody must have arranged that, but I didn't arrange it. Now that's uh, actually not my question. My question is whether you remember talking to Monica about her being concerned that I may have to answer some questions about how and why I was transferred from the Pentagon out of the White House. Fearing that this would... No, I don't remember that at all. ...or answers that would reveal your relationship. Oh, no, sir, I, I don't remember that. Maybe somebody, maybe she did, but I only remember... Uh, well, I don't remember that. That's all I can tell you. I don't remember that. Are you saying, uh, Mr. President, that you did not then say to uh, Ms. Lewinsky that you could always say that people in legislative affairs got you the job or helped you get it? I have no recollection of that, whatever. Are you saying you didn't say it? No, sir, I'm telling you, I, I want to say I, I, I don't recall, I don't have any memory of this as I sit here today. And I can tell you this, I never asked her to lie. I never did, and I don't have any recollection of the specific thing you're saying to me. Now, if I could back up, there were several times when Monica Lewinsky talked to me on the telephone in 1996, in person in 1997, about her being concerned about what anybody would say 
about her transfer from the White House to the Pentagon. But I, don't, I remember no conversation in which she was concerned about it for the reasons you just mentioned. And all my memory is she was worried about it because she thought it would keep her from getting a good job down the road. And she talked to me about it constantly in 1997. She thought, well, I'll never have my record clear unless I work somewhere in the White House complex where I can get a good recommendation. But in the context you mentioned it, I do not recall the conversation. Did you ever tell Ms. Lewinsky promise to her that you would do your best to get her back into the White House after the 1996 presidential election? What I told Ms. Lewinsky was that I would, I would do what I could to see if she had a good record at the, at the Pentagon. And she assured me she was doing a good job and working hard. That I would do my best to see that the fact that she had been sent away from the legislative affairs uh, section did not keep her from getting a job in the White House. And that is, in fact, what I tried to do. I had a conversation with uh, Ms. Scott about it, and I tried to do that. But I did not tell her I would or order someone to hire her, and I never did. And I, I wouldn't do that. It wouldn't be right. When you received the book, this gift from Monica, the President of the United States, this book that you liked and you talked to Monica about, did it come with a note? Do you remember the note that it came with, Mr. President? No, sir, I don't. Do you remember that in the note uh, she wrote that uh, she expressed uh, how much she missed you and how much she cared for you, and you and she later talked about this in this telephone conversation, and you said, and, and she apologized for putting such uh, emotional uh, romantic things in this note, and you said, uh, yeah, you shouldn't have written some of those things. You shouldn't put those things down on paper. Did you ever say anything like that to Ms. Lewinsky? Oh, I, I believe I did say something like that to Ms. Lewinsky. I don't remember doing something as late as you suggest. Uh, I'm not saying I didn't. I, I have no recollection of that. Keep in mind now, it had been quite a long time since I'd had any improper contact with her. And uh, she was in a funny way, almost more attached to me than she had been before. In 96, she had a long relationship, she said, with a man whom she liked a lot. And I didn't know what else was going on in her private life in 97, but she talked to me occasionally about people she was going out with. But normally, her language at this point was, if affectionate, was, was not improperly affectionate, I would say. So, but it could have happened. I wouldn't say it didn't. I just don't remember it at this late date. Let me refer back to one of the subjects we talked about uh, in one of the earlier breaks, right before one of the earlier breaks, and that is your meeting with uh, Mrs. Curry on January 18th. This is the Sunday after your deposition of the Paula Jones case. Yeah. You said that you spoke to her uh, in an attempt to refresh your own recollection about the events involving Ms. Lewinsky. Is that right? Yes. How did you making the statement, I was never alone with her, right, refresh your recollection? Well, first of all, let's remember the context here. I did not at that time know of your involvement in this case. I just knew that obviously someone had given them a lot of information, some of which struck me as accurate, some of which struck me as dead wrong but it led them to write, ask me a whole series of questions about Monica Lewinsky. Then on Sunday morning, the, uh, this Drudge report came out, uh, which used Betty's name, and uh, I thought that we were gonna be dead used by press comments. And I was trying to refresh my memory uh, about what the facts were. So when I said we were never alone right, I think I also asked her a number of other questions uh, because there were, there were several times, as I'm sure she would acknowledge, when I either asked her to be around. Uh, I remember once in particular when I was talking with Ms. Lewinsky when I asked Betty to be in the, actually in the next room, in the dining room, and as I testified earlier, once in her own office. But I meant that she was always in the Oval Office complex in, the pre in that complex while Monica was there. And I believe that this was part of a series of questions I asked her to try to quickly refresh my memory. So I wasn't trying to get her to say something that wasn't so. And in fact, I think she would recall that I told her to just relax, go in the grand jury and tell the truth when she'd been called as a witness. 
So when you said to Mrs. Curry that I was never alone with her, right, you just meant that you and Ms. Lewinsky would be somewhere, perhaps in the Oval Office uh, many times in your back study, is that correct? That's right, we were in the back study. And then Keep in mind, sir, I just want to, make, I was talking about 1997. I was never, ever trying to get Betty Curry to claim that on the occasions when Monica Lewinsky was there, when she wasn't anywhere around, that she wasn't. I would never have done that to her, and I don't think she thought about that. I don't think she thought I was referring to that. Did you put a date restriction? Did you make it clear to Mrs. Curry that you were only asking her whether uh, you were never alone with her after 1997? Well, I don't recall whether I did or not, but I, I assumed, if I didn't, I assumed she knew what I was talking about because it was the point at which Ms. Lewinsky was out of the White House and had to have someone wave her in in order to get in the White House. And I, I do not believe to this day that I was, uh, in 1997, that she was ever there and that I ever saw her unless Betty Curry was there. I don't believe she was. Do you agree with me that the statement, I was never alone with her, is incorrect? You were alone with Monica Lewinsky, weren't you? Well, it depend, again, it depends on how you define alone. Yes, we were alone from time to time, even during 1997, even when there, there was absolutely no improper contact occurring. Yes, there, that is accurate. Uh, but there were also a lot of times when, um, even though we, no one could see us, the doors were open to the halls, on both ends of the hall. People could hear. Uh, the Navy stewards could come in and out at will if they were around, other things could be happening. So uh, there were a lot of times when we were alone, but I never really thought we were. And sometimes when we, when, but as far as I know, what I was trying to determine, if I might, is that Betty was always around. And I believe she was always around, where I could uh, basically call her or get her if I needed her. When you said to Mrs. Curry, you could see and hear everything that wasn't true either, was it? As far as you knew, you've already seen my memory of Betty's that. Not there. My memory of that was that that she had the ability to, to hear what was going on if she came into the Oval Office from her office. And a lot of times, you know, when I was in the Oval Office, she just had the door open to her office. Then there was the door was never completely closed to the hall. So I think there was, a, I, I, I'm not entirely sure what I meant by that, but I could have meant that she generally would be able to hear conversations, even if she couldn't see them. And I think that's what I meant. Now, I could have been referring not generally to every time she was there, but one, uh, one particular time I remember when Ms. Lewinsky was there, when I asked Betty, and I'm sorry to say for reasons I don't entirely remember, to actually stay in the dining room while I talk with Monica. I do remember one such instance. Well, you've already testified that this, you did almost everything you could to keep this relationship secret. So would it be fair to say that even from Mrs. Curry, she didn't know about the nature that is your intimate, physically intimate relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, did she? As far as I know, she is unaware of what happened on the, uh, on the occasions when I saw her in 1996 when something improper happened. And she was unaware of the uh, one time that I recall in 1997 when something happened. I think she was quite well aware that I was determined to impose the appropriate limits on the relationship when I was trying to do it. And if, you know, anybody would, would hope that uh, this wouldn't become a public. Although I frankly, from 1996 on, always felt that uh, if I severed inappropriate contact with Ms. Lewinsky, sooner or later uh, it would get public. And I never thought it would be part of the Jones case. I never even thought about that. I never thought, I certainly never thought it would be part of your uh, responsibilities. My question but I did believe that she would talk about it. My question was more simple than that. Mrs. Curry did not know of the physically intimate nature of your relationship, did she? I don't believe she did, no. 
So you would have done, you, you, you tried to keep the nature, that nature of the relationship from Mrs. Curry. Absolutely. So I, you would not have engaged in those physically intimate acts if you knew that Mrs. Curry could see or hear that. Is that correct? That's correct, but keep in mind, sir, I was talking about 1997. That occurred to the, and I believe that occurred only once in February of 1997. I stopped it. I never should have started, and I certainly shouldn't have started it back after I resolved not to in 1996. And I was referring to 1997. And I, what, I, I, as I say, I do not know, her memory and mine may be somewhat different, I do not know whether I was asking her about a particular time when Monica was upset, and I asked her to stand, stay back in the dining area, or whether I was, uh, had reference to the fact that if she kept her door open, to the Oval Office, because there was always the door to the hallway was always somewhat open, that she would always be able to hear something if anything went on that was, you know, too loud or whatever. I do not know what I meant. I'm just trying to reconcile the two statements as best I can without being sure. There was at least one event where Mrs. Curry was definitely not even in the Oval Office area. Isn't that right? And I think you began to testify about that before. That was at the radio address. I'm not sure of that, but in, in that case, there was there was certainly someone else there. I don't know. I, I would I, be testing Mrs. Curry's memory about whether someone else was there. Well, I can say this: if, if I'm in the Oval Office, my belief is that there was someone else there, somewhere in the Oval Office complex. I've I've looked at our I've looked at the film. This this night has become legendary now. You know, I've looked at the. I've looked at the film we have. I've looked at my schedules. I've seen the people that with the radio address. I, I do believe that I was alone with her from 15 to 20 minutes. I do believe that things happened then which were inappropriate. I don't remember whether Betty was there or not, but I can't imagine that since all this happened more or less continuously, in that time period, there must have been someone who was working around the radio address who stayed around somewhere. I, that, that would be my guess. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm sorry I don't have records about who it would be, but I doubt very seriously if we were all alone in that Oval Office complex then. Mr. President, if there is a semen stain belonging to you on a dress of Ms. Lewinsky's, how would you explain that? Well, Mr. Bittman, I, I don't, first of all, when you asked me for a blood test, I gave you one promptly. You came over here and got it. And that's, we met that night, talked. So that's a question you already know the answer to, not if, but you know whether. And um, the main thing I can tell you is that doesn't affect the opening statement I made. Uh, the opening statement I made is that I had inappropriate intimate contact I take full responsibility for it. It wasn't her fault, it was mine. Uh, I, I do not believe that I violated the definition of sexual relations I was given by directly touching those parts of her uh, body with the intent to arouse or gratify. And that's all I have to say. I think for the rest, you know, you know what the evidence is. And, it doesn't affect that statement. Is it possible or impossible that your semen is on a dress belonging to Mr. Whiskey? I have nothing to add to my statement about it, sir. You, you know whether you know what the facts are. There's no point in a hypothetical. Don't you know what the facts are, also, Mr. President? I have nothing to add to my statement, sir. Getting back to the conversation you had with Mrs. Curry on January 18th. You told her, if, you, if she testified that you told her, Monica came on to me and I never touched her. You did, in fact, of course, touch Ms. Lewinsky, isn't that right? In a physically intimate way? Now, I've testified about that. And uh, that's one of those questions that I, I believe is answered by the statement that I made. 
What was your purpose in making these statements to Mrs. Curry if they weren't for the purpose to try to suggest to her what she should say if ever asked? Now, Mr. Bittman, I told you, the only thing I remember is when all this stuff blew up, I was trying to figure out what the facts were. I was trying to remember. I was trying to remember every time I had seen Ms. Lewinsky. Once this thing was in Drudge and there was this argument about what it was or was not going to be in Newsweek, that was a uh, clear uh, signal to me because Newsweek, uh, frankly, was uh, had become almost a sponsoring media outlet for the Paula Jones case and had a journalist who had been trying so far fruitlessly to find me in some sort of wrongdoing. And uh, so I knew this was all going to come out. I was trying, I did not know at the time, I will say again, I did not know that any of you were involved. I did not know that the Office of Independent Counsel was involved. And I was trying to get the facts and trying to think of the best defense we could construct in the face of what I thought was going to be a media onslaught. Uh, once you became involved, I told Betty Curry not to worry that, the, the, uh, that she had been through a, a terrible time. She'd lost her brother. She'd lost her sister. Her mother was in the hospital. I said, Betty, just don't worry about me. Just relax. Go in there and tell the truth. You'll be fine. Now, that's all there was in this context. Did the conversations that you had with Mrs. Curry, this conversation, did it refresh your recollection as to the events involving Ms. Lewinsky? Well, as I remember, I, I do believe, in fairness, that, that uh, you know, she may have felt some ambivalence about how to react because there were some times when uh, she seemed to, be, to say yes when I'm not sure she meant yes. There was a time, it seems like there was one or two things where she said, well, remember this out of the other thing, which did reflect my recollection. So I, I would say uh, a little yes and a little no. Why was it then that two or three days later, given that the Washington Post article came out on January 21st, why would you have had another conversation with Betty Curry asking or making the exact same statements to her? I don't know that I did. I remember having this one time. I was, I was, I, I don't know that I did. So. If Mrs. Curry says you did, are you disputing that? No, sir, I'm neither disputing. Excuse me, it, it's your representation. She testified that that conversation was, was when? I'm not making a representation as to what Mrs. Curry said. I'm asking the president if Mrs. Curry testified two or three days later, after, that, that two or three days after the conversation with the president on January 18th, that he called her into the Oval Office and went over the exact same statements that the president made to her on the 18th. Is that accurate? Is that a truthful statement by uh, Mrs. Curry, if she did. I do not remember how many times I talked to Betty Curry or when. I don't, I can't possibly remember that. I do remember when I first heard about this story breaking, trying to ascertain what the facts were, trying to ascertain what Betty's perception was. I remember that I was highly agitated, understandably, I think. And then I remember when I knew she was going to have to testify to the grand jury, and I, I felt terrible because she had been through this loss of her sister, this horrible accident at Christmas that killed her brother. Her mother was in the hospital. I was trying to do, to make it un her understand that I didn't want her to, to be untruthful to the grand jury. And if her memory was different from mine, it was fine. Just go in there and tell them what she thought. So that's all I remember. <coughs> Mr. President, my name is Jackie Bennett. If I understand uh, the current line of testimony, you're saying that you're only interested in uh, speaking with uh, Ms. Curry in the uh, days after your deposition was to refresh your own recollection? Yes. It was not I to impart instructions on how uh, she was to recall things in the future? No, and certainly not under oath. That Every day, sir, Mr. Bennett, uh, 
in, in the White House and in every other political organization when you're subject to a barrage of press questions of any kind, you always try to make the best case you can consistent with the facts, that is, while being truthful. Uh, but nothing, so I was concerned for a day or two there about this as a press story only. I had no idea you were involved in it for a couple of days. I think Betty Curry's testimony will be that I gave her explicit instructions or encouragement to just go in the grand jury and tell the truth. That's what I told her to do, and I Mr. thought she would. Mr. President, when did you learn about the Drudge Report reporting uh, allegations of you having a sexual relationship with someone at the White House? I believe the, it was the morning of the 18th, I think. What time of day, sir? I have no idea. Early morning hours? Yeah, I think somebody called me and told me about it. Maybe Bruce, maybe someone else. I'm not sure. But I learned early in the 18th of the Drudge Report. Very early morning hours, sir? Now, my deposition was on the 17th. Is that right? On Saturday the 17th, sir. Yeah, I think it was when I got up Sunday morning, I think. Maybe it was late Saturday night. I don't remember. Did you call Betty Curry, sir, after the Drudge Report hit the wire? I did. Did you call her at home? I did. Was that the night of the 17th? Night of the 17th, early morning hours of the 18th. Okay, yes. That's because, yes, I worked with Prime Minister Netanyahu that night until about midnight. Isn't that, isn't that right? Excuse me. I, I think the question is directed, Mr. Bennett, if you could help out by putting the day of the week, I think that would be helpful. Saturday night, Sunday morning. Yes. I called Betty Curry. As soon, I think about as soon as I could, after I finished with Prime Minister Netanyahu and then the aftermath of that meeting, planning where we were going next in the Middle East peace process. Can we take a two minute break, please? Can I ask uh, one other question first? Sure. I think where this is confused on dates, that's all. That's what I, I, I didn't think it was the night of the 17th. Can we have a break and I could get straightened out? Sure. May I ask one other question? This is a question I forgot to ask. I don't want to get mixed up on these dates now. Go ahead. Uh, this is, uh, they wanted to know whether, they want us to clarify that the, pr the President's knowledge, your knowledge, Mr. President, as to uh, the approach to our office this morning, uh, that as we were told, that you would give a general statement about the nature of your relationship with Ms. Lewinsky, which you have done, and yet that you would, you did not want to go into any of the details about the relationship, and that if we pressed on going into the details, that you would object to going into the details, and the grand jurors, before they wanted, if they wanted to vote on some other matters, they wanted to know whether you were aware of that that we were told that. Well, Mr. President, who told you that? that this, is, this, is, this is not a fair question when you say you were told. Who told you? Who told me what? The question? You, you, said, you said the grand jury was told. We have kept the grand jury informed, as we normally would, of the proceedings here. Right. And, and I'm sorry, who, but who are you representing who told you or the grand jurors anything? Is that, is that our conversation? Yes. Yes. yes, our conversation. Yes. That was, in substance, related to the grand jurors. And what, what's your question to me, Mr. Bennett? Whether you were aware of the facts that I just uh, described. Yes, sir. L let me say this. I knew that Mr. Kendall was going to talk with Judge Starr. What we wanted to do was to be as helpful as we could to you on the question of whether you felt I was being truthful. Uh, when I said I did not have sexual relations with Ms. Lewinsky, as defined in that definition one in this, uh, in my testimony. And I thought the best way to do that and still preserve some measure of privacy and dignity would be to invite all you and the grand jurors to ask, well, would you consider this, that, or the other thing covered by the definition. You asked me several questions there, and I did my best to answer whether I thought they were covered by the definition, and said if I thought they were covered, you could co uh, conclude from that that I, my testimony is I did not do them. If those things, if things 
are not covered by the definition, and I don't believe they're covered, then I could not, uh, then they shouldn't be within this discussion one way or the other. Now, I know this is somewhat unusual, but I would say to the grand jury, to, to put yourself in my position, this is not a typical grand jury testimony. I, I have to assume a report is going to Congress. There's a videotape being made of this, allegedly because only one member of the grand jury is absent. This is highly unusual. Uh, and in addition to that, I have sustained a, a, a breathtaking number of leaks of grand jury proceedings. And so I think I sh am right to answer all the questions about perjury but not to say things which will be forever in the historic annals of the United States because of this unprecedented videotape and may be leaked at any time. I just think it's a mistake. And so I'm doing my best to cooperate with the grand jury and still protect myself, my family, and my office. Thank you. Conversations with Betty Curry following your deposition on Saturday, January 17th. Do you recall that? I do. All right. Uh, and you recall contacting Betty Curry, calling her, and instructing her on the evening of Saturday night after your deposition and telling her to come in the next day. Yes, sir, I do. Sunday was normally her day off, isn't that so? Yes, it was. And so you were making special arrangements for her to come back into the White House. Isn't that so? Well, yes, I asked her to come back in and talk to me. And it was at that time that you spoke with her, and Mr. Bittman and Mr. Weisenberg have asked you questions about what you said in that conversation. Isn't that so? Yes, they have. A I don't know whether that's the time, but they. I did talk to her as soon as I realized that the deposition had become more about Monica Lewinsky than Paula Jones. Um, I asked her, you know, if she knew anything about this. I said, uh, you know, it's obvious that uh, this is going to be a matter of press speculation. Uh, and I was trying to go through the litany of what had happened between us and uh, ask some questions. Well, in fairness, it, was, it would be more than a matter of uh, simple press speculation, isn't that so, Mr. President? There was there was a question about whether you had testified fully, completely, and honestly on the preceding day in your deposition. Well, actually, Mr. Bennett, I didn't think about that then. I um, this has been a rather unprecedented development, and I I wasn't even thinking about the the uh, independent counsel getting into this. Uh, so, at that moment, I knew nothing about it. And I was more interested in what the facts were and uh, uh, whether Ms. Curry knew anything about it, knew uh, anything about what Monica Lewinsky knew about it. Mr. President, you've told us uh, at least uh, a little bit about your understanding of how the term sexual relations was used and what you understood it to mean in the context of your deposition. Is that correct? That is correct. And you've told us, uh, that was a lawsuit Paula Jones filed in which she alleged that you asked her to perform oral sex. Isn't that so? That was her allegation. That was her allegation. And notwithstanding that that was her allegation, you testified that you understood the term sexual relations in the context of the questions you were being asked to mean something else. At least insofar as you were the recipient rather than uh, the performer. Sir, Paula Jones' lawyers pulled out that definition, not me. And Judge Susan Weber Wright ruled on it, just as she later ruled their case had no merit in the first place, no legal merit, and dismissed it. I had nothing to do with the definition. I had nothing to do with the judge's rulings. I was simply there answering the questions they put to me under the terms of reference they imposed. Well, the grand jury would like to know, Mr. President, why it is that you think that oral sex performed on you does not fall within the definition of sexual relations 
as used in your deposition? Because that is if the deponent is the person who has oral sex performed on him, then the contact is with not with anything on that list, but with the lips of another person. It seems to me self-evident that that's what it is. And uh, I thought it was curious. Let me remind you, sir, I read this carefully. And I thought about it. I thought about what contact meant. I thought about what intent to arouse or gratify meant. And I had to admit under this definition that I'd actually had sexual relations with Jennifer Flowers. Now, I would rather have taken a whipping than done that after all the trouble I'd been through with Jennifer Flowers and uh, the money I knew that she had made for the story she told about this alleged 12-year affair, which we had done a great deal to disprove. So I didn't like any of this, but I had done my best to deal with it. And uh, that's what I thought. And I think that's what most people would think reading that. Would you have been prepared, to an if asked by the uh, Jones lawyers, would you have been prepared to answer a question directly asked about oral sex performed on you by Monica Lewinsky? If the judge had required me to answer it, of course I would have answered it. And I would have answered it truthfully. By the way, do you believe that the uh, Jones litigants had the same understanding of sexual relations that uh, you claim you have? I don't know what their understanding was, sir. My belief is that they thought they'd get this whole thing in and that they were going to, what they were trying to do is do just what they did with Jennifer Flowers. They, they wanted to find anything they could get from me or anyone else that was negative and then they wanted to leak it to hurt me in the press, which they did even though the judge ordered them not to. So I think, their, their, I think their position, Mr. Bennett, you asked the question, their position was we're going to cast the widest net we can and get as much embarrassing stuff as we can and then dump it out there and see if we can make him bleed. I think that's what they were trying to do. Don't you think, sir, that they could have done more damage to you politically or in whatever context uh, if they had understood the definition the same way you did and asked the question directly? I don't know, sir. As I said, I didn't work with their lawyers in preparing this case. I knew the case was wrong. I knew what our evidence was. By the time of this deposition, they knew what their evidence was. Their whole strategy was, well, our lawsuit's not good, but maybe we can hurt him with the discovery. And, you know, they did some. But it didn't amount to much. And did I want, if I could, to avoid talking about Monica Lewinsky? Yes, I'd give anything in the world not to be here talking about it. I'd, be giving, I'd give anything in the world not to have to admit what I've had to admit today. But if you look at my answer in the Flowers uh, deposition, at least you know I tried to carefully fit all my answers within the framework there because otherwise there was no reason in the wide world for me to do anything other than make the statements I'd made about Jennifer Flowers since 1991 that I did not have a 12-year affair with her and that are these the following accusations she made are false so that's all I can tell you I can't prove anything but you did have a great deal of anxiety in the uh, uh, hours and days following the end of your deposition on the 17th. Isn't that fair to say? Well, I was had a little anxiety the next day, of course, because of the Drudge Report. And uh, I had an anxiety after the deposition because it was more about Monica Lewinsky than, than it was about Paula Jones. The specificity of the questions relating to Monica Lewinsky uh, alarmed you. Isn't that fair to say? Yes, and it bothered me, too, that I couldn't remember the answers. It bothered me that I couldn't uh, uh, as, as Mr. Weisenberg pointed out, it, it bothered me that I couldn't remember all the answers. I did the best I could. And so I wanted to know what the deal was, sure. Uh, Mr. President, to your knowledge, have you turned over in response to the grand jury subpoenas all gifts that Monica Lewinsky gave you? 
To my knowledge, I have, sir. As you know, on occasion, Mr. Kendall has asked for your help in identifying those gifts. And I think there were a couple that we came across in our search that were not on the list you gave us that I remembered in the course of our search had been given to me to Monica Lewinsky, and we gave them to you. So, to the best of my knowledge, we have given you everything we have. Can you explain why on the very day that Monica Lewinsky testified in the grand jury on August 6th of this year, you wore a necktie that she had given you? No, sir, I don't believe I did. What, what necktie was it? The necktie you wore on August 6th, sir. Well, I don't know that it was a necktie that Monica Lewinsky gave me. Can you describe it to me? Well, I, I don't want to take time at this point, but we will uh, provide you with uh, photographic evidence of that, Mr. President. If, if you give me, uh, I don't believe that's accurate, Mr. Bennett. So let me ask. But if question. you give, if you give it to me, if, if and, and I look at it and I remember that she gave it to me, I'll be happy to produce it. I do not believe that's right. Uh, well, if you remember that she gave it to you, why haven't you produced it to the grand jury? I don't remember that she gave it to me. That's why I asked you what the tie was. I Can have you? no earthly idea. I believe that, uh, that I did not wear a tie she gave me on August the 6th. Can you tell us why Bayani Nelvis wore a tie that Monica Lewinsky had given you on the day he appeared in the grand jury? I don't know that he did. Have you given Bayani Nelvis any ties, sir? Oh, yes, a lot of ties. And so, if he wore the tie that you gave him, that Monica Lewinsky had given you, that would uh, not have been by design. Is that uh, what you're telling us? Oh, absolutely not. Let, not let me, it, may I explain, Mr. Bennett? Yes. It won't take long. Every year since I've been president, I've gotten quite a large number of ties, as you might imagine. I get. I have a couple of friends, one in Chicago and one in Florida, who give me a, a lot of ties. A lot of other people who send me ties all the time or give them to me when I see them. So I always have the, the growing number of ties in my closet. What I normally do is someone gives me a tie as a gift, is I wear it a time or two, I may use it, but at the end of every year, and sometimes two times a year, sometimes more, I go through my tie closet and I think of all the things that I, I won't wear a lot or that I might give away, and I give them mostly to the men who work there. I give them to people like uh, Glenn and Nelvis who work in the kitchen back in the White House, or uh, the gentlemen who are my stewards, or the butlers, or the, or the people who run the elevators. And I give a lot of ties away a year. I bet I, excluding Christmas, I bet I give 30, 40, maybe more ties away a year. And then, of course, at Christmas a lot. So. There would be nothing unusual if, in fact, Nelvis had a tie that originally had come into my tie closet from Monica Lewinsky. It wouldn't be unusual. It wouldn't be by design. And there are several other people of whom that is also true. Mr. President, I'd like to move to a different area right now. I'd like to uh, ask you some questions about Kathleen Willey. Uh, you met Kathleen Willey during your 1992 campaign, isn't that so? Yes, sir, I did. As a matter of fact, you first saw her at a rope line at the Richmond, Virginia airport on October 13, 1992. Is that not correct? I don't believe that is correct. When did you first meet her, sir? Well, let me ask you this. When was the debate in Richmond? I believe it was October 13, 1992, sir. Well, I believe that I had met her, I believe I had met her before then because uh, governor Wilder, I believe that was his last year's governor, I think that's right, 92-93. Uh, I, I believe that I met her in connection with her involvement with Governor Wilder. And uh, I have the impression, just, it's kind of a vague memory, but I have the impression that, I had, that I'd met her once before, at least once before I came to that Richmond debate. Now, I'm not sure of that. Well, at least if you had met her before. But I am quite sure she was at the Richmond debate, and I did not meet her there. I'm quite sure of that. Mr. President, you've seen television footage of you standing on a rope line with Donald Byer, Lieutenant Governor Donald Byer, uh -huh. asking Mr. Byer uh, uh, for the name of Kathleen Well, You've seen that footage, haven't you? I don't know that I've seen it, but I am aware that it exists. All right. 
I was and, and you can see him, uh, you can read his lips, he's saying the name Kathleen Willie in response to a question from you, is that so? That's what I've heard. And as a matter of fact, you sent Nancy Hernreich, who was present on that day, to go get her telephone number, didn't you, sir? I don't believe so. You don't believe so? Well, let, let me say this. If that is true, then I'm quite certain that I had met her before. I would never call someone out of the blue that I saw on a rope line and send Nancy Hernreich to get her number to do it. Even uh, if you were just learning her name for the first time? That's correct. I'm, I'm not so sure that I didn't ask Don Byer if he was on the rope line with me who she was because I thought I had seen her before or I knew I'd seen her before and I didn't remember her name. Now, I do that all the time. Mr. For President, men and women. I'm sorry. Do you recall that you sent Nancy Hernreich to get her telephone number? No, I don't. All right. Uh, do you recall having received her telephone number, calling her that night? No, sir, I don't. Do you recall inviting her to meet with you at your hotel that night? No, sir, I do not. Do you recall where you stayed in Richmond, Virginia, during the uh, debate you told us about? Well, I stayed at some hotel there, I believe. Actually, did you stay at the Williamsburg Inn, not in Richmond? Yeah, that's right. We prepared in Williamsburg. That's correct. I, I believe we prepared in Williamsburg and then went to Richmond for the debate, and then I think we spent the night in Richmond, and the next day I think we had a rally before we left town. I believe that's right. Do you know of any reason Kathleen Willie's telephone number would uh, appear on your toll records from your room in, in Williamsburg? No, it, didn't it, call her. no there, I, I'm not denying that I called her, sir. You asked me uh, a specific question. I, I won't deny that I called her. I don't know whether I did or not. Matter of fact, you called her twice that day, didn't you, sir? I don't recall. I may well have done it, and I don't know why I did it. Well, does it refresh your recollection? Uh, that you called her and invited you to, in, invited her to come to your room that night, sir. I don't believe I did that, sir. If uh, Kathleen Willie has said that, she's uh, mistaken or lying. Is that correct, Mr. President? I do not believe I did that. That's correct. But what is your best recollection of that conversation, those conversations? I don't remember talking to her, but I, uh, it seems to me that at some point, this is why I believe I'd met her before, too. But at some point, I had some actual person-to-person -person conversation with her about uh, my sore throat and what she thought would be good for it or something like that. I have some vague memory of that. That's it. Is this the chicken soup conversation, Mr. President? Well, I don't know if I would come. Maybe that's what she said I should have. I don't remember. But I have no recollection, sir, of asking her to come to my room. I did, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't. I, can't, I, I won't deny calling her. I don't know if I did call her. I don't know if she tried to call me first. I don't know anything about that. I, I just, uh, I met her and Doug Wilder. Uh, I, I, I remember that she and her husband were active for Governor Wilder, and that's about all I remember, except that I had a conversation with her around the Richmond debate. I do remember talking to her there. Mr. President, let's move ahead to the episode uh, on November 29, 1993, in which uh, Mrs. Willie met you in your office at the Oval. Uh, the, uh, the subject matter of the 60 Minutes broadcast a few months ago. You recall that episode? I certainly do. Uh, Mr. President, in fact, on that day, you did make sexual advances on Kathleen Willie. Is that not correct? That's false. Uh, you did grab her breast, as she said? I did not. Uh, you did place your hand on her groin? area, as she said. No, I didn't. And you placed her hand on your genitals, did you not? Mr. Bennett, I didn't do any of that. And the questions you're asking, I think, betray the bias of this operation that has troubled me for a long time. You know what evidence was released after the 60 Minutes broadcast that I think pretty well shattered Kathleen Willie's credibility. You know what people down in Richmond said about her. You know what she said about other people that wasn't true? I don't know if you've made all this available to the grand jury or not. She was not telling the truth. She asked for the appointment with me. She asked for it repeatedly. Did she make a sexual advance on you, Mr. President? On that day, no, she did not. She was troubled. On some other day? I wouldn't call it a sexual advance. She was always very friendly. 
but I never took it uh, seriously. Mr. President, you mentioned uh, the uh, documents that were released and information that came out uh, from people in Richmond, et cetera, uh, after the 60 Minutes uh, piece was broadcast. Uh, as a matter of fact, you were required under the court's rulings to produce those documents uh, in response to document requests by the uh, Jones litigants. Is that correct? No, I believe the Jones litigants, the request for production of documents to me, ran the documents that were in my personal files and in my personal possession and did not cover documents that were White House files. So I don't believe we were required to produce them. Uh, as a matter of fact, when that story first ran, sir, uh, before 60 Minutes was uh, back in July or so of 97, I was aware that we had some letters. I didn't dream Kathleen Willie. I didn't remember that she'd written us as much as she had and called as much as she had and asked to see me as often as she had after this alleged incident. I didn't know the volume of contact that she had which undermined the story she has told. But I knew there was some of it. And I made a decision that I did not want to release it voluntarily and to her, uh, after the, the Newsweek ran the story because her friend Julie Steele was in the story saying she asked her, she, Kathleen Willie, asked her to lie. And because, frankly, her husband had committed suicide, she apparently was out of money. And I thought, who knows how anybody would react under that? So I didn't. But now when 60 Minutes came with the story and everybody blew it up, I thought we would release it. But I do not believe we were required to release White House documents to the Jones lawyers. Mr. President, have you made a decision on whether to stay beyond the four hours we agreed to to accept questions from the grand jury? Uh, we have made an agreement, Mr. Bennett, to give you four hours. We're going to do that. By my watch, there are about 12 minutes left. I guess that's no. Is that correct, Mr. Kendall? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Could, may I ask you a question? Could I have a two-minute break? Sure. We'll get to it. Thanks. I'm sorry to bother you, but this I know we're getting to the end, but I need to. Mr. President, at various times in this investigation, uh, officials have invoked executive privilege in response to the questions that have been posed to them by the grand jury and in the grand jury. One of the grand jurors has posed the question, did you personally authorize the invocation of executive privilege? If the answer is authorized, I think the answer to that would be yes. But I, I would like the grand jury to know something. Um, in, in the cases where the, we raise the lawyer-client privilege or executive privilege, or where the Secret Service raised their privilege, and when I, I had nothing to do with that. I did not authorize it, approve it, or anything else. That was something they asked to be free to make their decision on by themselves. In none of those cases did I actually have any worry about what the people involved would say. The reason those privileges were advanced and litigated was that I believe that uh, there was an honest difference between uh, Judge Starr and the Office of Independent Counsel and uh, Mr. Ruff, my counsel, and I about what the proper balance was in the constitutional framework. And I did not want to put the presidency uh, at risk of being weakened as an institution without having those matters litigated. Now, we've lost some of those matters. Our people have testified, and the grand jury is free to conclude whether they believe that the testimony they gave was damaging to me. But I don't, I don't imagine it was, and I wasn't worried about it. It was a, a, an honest difference of constitutional principle between Judge Starr and the Office of Independent Counsel in the White House. Mr. President, a couple of very brief questions given our time. Uh, the White House's outside counsel, Mr. Eggleston, withdrew the White House's appeal from Chief Judge Johnson's ruling that the invocation of executive privilege had to give way to the grand jury's right to the information. That ruling in connection with the testimony of Mr. Blumenthal and Mr. Lindsay. Were you informed 
of that fact that the appeal had been withdrawn. I was informed of it, and uh, I, as a matter of fact, I was consulted about it, and I strongly supported it. I didn't want to appeal it. Uh, it was, uh, I have, my, my main difference, Judge Starr, as you know, with you is, is uh, and with some of the court decisions, is on the extent to which members of the White House counsel staff, like Mr. Lindsey, should be able to counsel the president on matters that may seem like they're private, like the Jones case, but inevitably intrude on the daily work of the president. Uh, but I didn't really want to advance an executive privilege claim in this case uh, beyond having it litigated so that we, would, we had not given up on principle this matter without having some uh, judge rule on it. So and, I and made and, Excuse me, and you're satisfied that you now have the benefit of that ruling, is that correct? Well, yes, I just didn't want to, I, I didn't want to, yes, and I didn't, I made the, I actually, I think, made the call, or at least I supported the call. I did not, I strongly felt we should not appeal your victory on the executive privilege issue. Thank you. Mr. President, among the many remaining questions of the grand jurors, is one that uh, they would like answered uh, directly without relation to, uh, without regard to inferences, which is the following. Did Monica Lewinsky perform oral sex on you? They would like a direct answer to that, yes or no. Well, that's a, not the first time that question's been asked, but since I believe, and I think any person, reasonable person would believe that that is not covered in the definition of sexual relations I was given, uh, I'm not going to answer except to refer to my statement. I had intimate uh, contact with her that was inappropriate. I do not believe any of the contacts I had with her violated the definition I was given. Therefore, I believe I did not do anything but testify truthfully on these matters. We have a couple of photos of the tie that you wore. Yeah, would you please give them to me? Yes. Now this is this August 6th, is that correct? 1998, the day that Monica Lewinsky appeared at the grand jury. And uh, my question to you on that is, were you sending some kind of a signal to her by wearing no, sir. one of the ties? Let me, let me finish if you don't mind. Sure, I'm sorry. My were apologies. You, were you sending some kind of a signal to her uh, by wearing a tie she had given you on the day that she appeared in front of the grand jury? No, sir. I, I don't believe she gave me this tie. And if I was sending a signal, I'm about to send a terrible signal, and maybe you ought to invite her to talk again. I don't, I don't want to make light about this. I don't believe she gave me this tie. I don't remember giving her giving me this tie. And I had absolutely no thought of this in my mind when I wore it. If she did, I, 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 I don't remember it, and this is the very first I've ever heard of it. Did you realize when you, can I just have for the record, what are the uh, exhibit numbers? Yeah, this should be uh, uh, Jason 5 and 6. All right. Mr. Bennett has some more questions. Mr. President, we were talking about your responses uh, to document requests in the Jones litigation. And I had just uh, asked you about uh, turning over uh, the Kathleen Willie correspondence. Should we call that? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, and if I understand your testimony, you did not believe that the request for documents compelled you uh, to search for those documents in the White House? Mr. Bennett, I, I want to answer this question in a way that is completely satisfactory uh, to you and the grand jury without violating the lawyer-client privilege, uh, which is still intact. It was my understanding that in the request for production of documents that those requests ran against and operated against my personal files. Now, I have some personal files in the White House. And I'm sorry, in this case, I'm not my own lawyer, and I don't know, I don't know how the distinction is made between, <clears throat> excuse me, files which are the personal files of the president and files which are White House files. But I do have a very clear memory that we were duty bound to, uh, to search and uh, turn over evidence, or excuse me, documents that, was, that were in my personal file, 
but not in the White House files. And I believe that the letters to which you refer, Miss Willie's letters and Miss Willie's phone messages, uh, were in the White House file. And therefore, I was instructed at least that they were, that we had fully complied with the Jones lawyer's, Jones lawyer's request and that these documents were outside the request. Mr. President, you're not contending that White House documents, documents stored in the fashion these were stored, are beyond your care, custody, or control, are you? Mr. Bennett, that may be a legal term of art that I don't have the, the capacity to answer. All, I, I can only tell you what I remember. I remember being told in no uncertain terms that if these were personal files of the President, we had to produce documents. If they were essentially White House files, we were not bound to do so. Um, and so we didn't. Um, so you're saying somebody told you that you didn't have to produce White House documents? That's okay. right. I question the witness that this question should not invade the sphere of the attorney-client privilege. Yes. Any conversations with, with the counsel or privilege? Let, let me say, uh, maybe, Mr. Kendall, we need a break here. I'm not trying, I'm trying to avoid invading the lawyer-client privilege. I can just tell you that I did, I did the best I could to comply with uh, this. Uh, and when eventually we did make, of course, all of this public. And it, it was damaging to Miss Willie and her credibility. It was terribly damaging to her. And the first time she came out with this story, I didn't do it. I only did it <clears throat> when they went back on 60 Minutes and they made this big deal of it. And it turned out she had tried to sell this story and make all this money. And I must say, when I saw how many letters and phone calls and messages there were that totally undercut her account, I, I myself was surprised. But you but knew there were letters. I did, sir. And, and I knew the White that House is under your control, isn't it, Mr. President? Well, Mr. Bennett, again, I'm not trying to be... Uh, <laughs> some days I think it's under my control, and some days I'm not so sure. But if you're asking me as a matter of law, uh, I don't want to discuss that because that's... I mean, I mean, I'd be glad to discuss it, but I'm not the person who's, uh, who should make that decision. I, that decision should be made by someone who can uh, give me appropriate advice, and I don't want to violate the lawyer-client privilege here. Well, Mr. President, how, how are the uh, letters from Kathleen Willey that, uh, that uh, surfaced after the 60 Minutes episode here any different from the uh, correspondence and other matters, tangible items, tangible things, uh, of Monica Lewinsky? Well, the, the items you asked for from Monica Lewinsky that I produced to you, you know, the, the, that there was a tie, a coffee cup, uh, a number of other things I had, then I told you there were some things that had been in my possession that I no longer had. I, uh, I don't know if I did that. It was one book, I remember, uh, that I left on vacation last summer. The same documents that the Jones litigants had asked you yeah, for. Yeah, but at any rate, they were different, but they were in my, the gifts were in my personal possession, clearly. In your office at the Oval? Well, uh, in the books, now that the presidential books were with my other books that belonged to me personally, they were in the Oval. Where do you draw the line, sir, between personal and White House? Uh, you're talking about some documents that are in the, uh, the Oval Office. Uh, but, and we, we don't see where you're drawing the line. Well, Mr. Bennett, I don't think these were, I think the Lewinsky gifts were all non-documents. And you, you can, I, just, just a moment. You, if, I, I'd like to finish answering the question, please. Because this is a legitimate question, I think. There, you, there's somebody in the White House, Mr. Bennett, who can answer your question. And you could, you could call them up and they could answer it uh, under oath for you. There is some... Uh, way of disaggregating what papers are personal to the president and what papers are part of the White House official uh, archives of papers. And I don't know how the distinction is made. I just Did you don't direct know. that personnel, Nancy Hernreich or anyone else, make a search for correspondence from Kathleen Willey and Monica Lewinsky when those documents were called for in the Jones litigation, sir? Did you direct that somebody on the White House staff look for those documents? I don't believe that I was uh, in charge of doing that, the document search, sir. Uh, so it, 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 the strict answer to, your, to that question is that I didn't. So you sat back 
and relied on this legalistic distinction between your personal, which you're in control of, and the White House, which, by the way, you're also in control of. Is that not correct? I won't object to the argumentative form of the question. We'll allow the witness to answer it. We're now over time, even 30 seconds of this debate. Mr. Bennett. I haven't said this all day long, but I would like to say it now. Most of my time and energy in the last five and a half years has been devoted to my job. Now, during that five and a half years, I have also had to contend with things no previous president has ever had to contend with. A lawsuit that was dismissed for lack of legal merit, but that cost me a fortune and was designed to embarrass me. Uh, this independent counsel inquiry, which has gone on a very long time and cost a great deal of money, and about which serious questions have been raised, and a number of other things. And during this whole time, I have tried as best I could to keep my mind on the job the American people gave me. I did not make uh, the legal judgment about how the documents were decided upon that should be given to the Jones lawyers and one that shouldn't. And I might add that Miss Willie would have been very happy that these papers were not turned over because they damaged her credibility so much uh, had they not ultimately been turned over after she made, uh, I think, the grievous error of going on 60 Minutes and saying all those things that were not true. But I did not make the decision. It was not my job. This thing was being managed by other people. I was trying to do my job. Uh, Mr. President, with the grand jury, I'm notified, still has unanswered questions of you, and we appeal to you again to make yourself available to answer those questions. Mr. Bennett, our agreement was for four hours. We have not counted the break time and, against that. And I think you know, Mr. Bennett, <clears throat> I wish I could do it. I wish the grand jurors had been allowed to come here today as we invited them to do. Uh, I wanted them down here. I wanted them to be able to see me directly. I wanted them to be able to ask these questions directly, but we made an agreement that was different, and I think I will go ahead and stick with the terms of it. The invitation was made after there was political fallout over the deposition uh, circumstances with the uh, satellite transmission and the uh, taping. Isn't that so? I don't know about the taping, Mr. Bennett. I, I understood that the prospect of the grand jurors coming down here was raised fairly early. I don't know. Just but anyway, I wish they could have. I respect the grand jury. Just I wish for the record, the invitation to the grand jury was contingent upon us not videotaping, and we had to videotape because we have an absent grand jury. Thank Is you. Is that the only reason, Mr. Weisenberg, you have to videotape? Well, yeah. You want to answer that, Mr. Weisenberg? <laughs> Thank you very much.